remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And, uh, you know, the last three years plus that we've done this show, we've talked about a lot of topics, we've discussed a lot of things, we've discussed a lot about Barack Obama. And, you know, I've, I've come to you on certain occasions with certain topics and I've been angry about something Barack Obama's done or I've been mad or I've been quizzical about something or maybe I've made fun of him about something. But for the first time in three years tonight... I come to you absolutely shocked and stunned at something Barack Obama has done. And, and that has never happened on this show. I, I've never been genuinely surprised at something Barack Obama did until the last 48 hours. Undoubtedly, you've heard by now that um, Barack Obama exchanged five terrorists from Gitmo for one American prisoner of war who turns out is probably a deserter. Even that one shocked me. I never would have saw that coming. I, I never thought, well, I don't know. I'm not going to say I thought it was impossible, but I... If you go back to September 11th, 2001, that afternoon, and, you know, after we'd seen the attacks and the attacks were kind of done and we were starting to make some sense of everything and it was starting to descend upon us, just what the hell had just happened? And, and we all, including me, started to realize that, okay, a time of relative peace in our nation is done. We are going to war. We are going to engage in the next great war in American history that, you know, we took care of the Soviet Union, the Cold War was done. 10, 15 years of relative peace, and it was shattered by 9-11. And we knew that afternoon that we were going to war. If you would have gone back in time and, and found me that afternoon of 9-11 and would have told me that day, as I started to realize war was upon us, if you would have told me that one day, 12 and a half years later, a sitting president would release five terrorists back to our enemy. I would have thought you're absolutely crazy. It would never have crossed my mind. Something like that could have possibly happened with, with any president. Granted, we didn't know the name Barack Obama back then, but I couldn't have imagined anybody, even a politician I disagree with, doing something like that. Make no mistake, this is not just a political disagreement. I've had plenty of those with Barack Obama over the years. We've documented a lot of them here, but that's not what this is about. This goes to the very heart of the primary thing a president is supposed to do. The primary thing a federal government is supposed to do, which is to protect Americans from their enemies. To keep us safe. Heck, if it weren't for that need, it would be hard to... It would be hard to even rationalize why we would need a federal government at all if not for that. That most basic of government, federal government responsibility, and Obama has not only botched it, he has, he has completely turned his back on it. I don't know another way to put it. And then you stop and you look back at Obama's history since he's been in office. It's not like this is an isolated incident. You go back to his history of treating Muslims and terrorists, and I will use those words interchangeably here, and I really don't give a damn what you think about it. You look at Obama's long history of treating Muslims and terrorists with kit gloves. When you look at the Fort Hood shooting and him trying to minimize the talk of Islamic terrorism and oh it was workplace violence no it was a Muslim shooting up an army base that's what it was you wanted to call it workplace violence when you go to the Boston Marathon bombing and you know, we found out that 
the two guys that perpetrated that were Muslim terrorists and Obama had the audacity to go on a press conference, go on television and criticize us for daring to jump to conclusions about Muslim terrorism when it turned out we were right. It was Muslim terrorism. Oh, but he had a real problem with us speculating that or even, even entertaining that idea. No, 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 no. We had to treat it like it could be anything. We had to ignore the nose on our face and treat it like we just didn't know where that could have come from. As though every culture in the world plants shrapnel-filled bombs alongside the road. And you look at Benghazi. And Barack Obama let Americans die, did not give them help, and then tried to spin the story to blame it on a video, blame it on anything he could, so that his precious political campaign would not be sullied by the reminder to America that yes, we are still at war and we still have enemies who want to kill us. And you put it all together, it, it seems to me like a peace at all costs attitude. It almost seems to me like you could sum up Barack Obama's foreign policy in the phrase, peace even if it kills us. Now, those of you who've watched me for these last three years, you know that I'm not one of these guys to come on here with a bunch of conspiracy theories and all this Manchurian candidate stuff and oh, Barack Obama was secretly sent here by someone else to do this. I've never gone that route. But I'll tell you what, after something like this, it's awful hard not to entertain that idea. It's, it's awful hard not to kind of listen to some of those people now. It's getting harder and harder not to consider it. But whether, whether Barack Obama is nefariously trying to sabotage America or whether he's just a neophyte who's been isolated in academia all his life and who therefore doesn't understand the real world and doesn't understand human condition and human reaction, whichever one of those things it is, it ends up being the same result. In the final analysis, it does not matter if Barack Obama is in bed with the Muslims and the terrorists. Frankly, I don't know. And it doesn't matter if, on the other hand, Barack Obama has just been so brainwashed by academia and liberalism that he'll sacrifice our safety because in his twisted mind, he thinks it's the right thing to do. I don't know which one of those two motivations is at play here, but it doesn't matter because it's the same result either way. Man, there's times in life that motivation doesn't matter. There's times in life that why you do something doesn't matter. What you did is what is important or what you did not do is what is important. That's what you're judged on in any area of life, any job, any responsibility you have. And Obama has failed this one miserably. That most basic and important role of a president to secure and protect the American people and not in this one isolated incident, but consistently for six years. Barack Obama has been derelict in that duty. He has turned his back on that duty. He's prioritized other things far higher than that duty. If he's even viewed it as a duty at all. The only answer to this, and I do not say this lightly, but I think we're at this point. I hear people talk about impeachment. Well, yeah, I've been talking about that for a long time, but I don't think impeachment's good enough right now, folks. I don't think impeachment speaks to the gravity of what has happened here, releasing terrorists to kill us. For a guy who at, at best was an idiot, but most likely was a freaking deserter who was capitulating with the Taliban. My God! We give up five terrorists to... You release one more? What? How does that math make sense? Oh my! It makes your head explode to think about it. And impeachment's not enough. 
Folks, the only answer at this point for Barack Obama, the only answer is to arrest him. We must arrest Barack Obama, walk him out of the Oval Office in handcuffs. We must try him for treason. We must find him guilty. And yes, we must execute him under the law. Now, I don't say that lightly. And some of you are jumping up and down and screaming, let me be clear, because you're going to criticize me one way or the other. Let's make sure that you criticize me for the right thing. I am not saying that some idiot needs to go out there and hide behind a grassy knoll and, and pull a Kennedy on him. I'm not saying that at all. That would cause far more problems than it would solve. I'm not suggesting that. That's the wrong answer. The right answer is to use the laws we have in place, use the justice system we have in place to bring Barack Obama to justice. That specifically is what I am suggesting. And if you want to criticize me on that, bring it on. But before some of you liberals get out of your head and claim I'm advocating for some things I'm not advocating, let's be clear. You want to criticize me? Criticize me for what I said. Criticize me for what I've advocated. And you can bring that on, motherfuckers. Because that's what needs to happen. And pardon my language, but I think you understand the gravity of this. Now, once the treason case is taken care of, we then have the vexing question. What do we do about this war? You know, what has been maddening to me is I'm hearing people in the media, particularly MSNBC, but they're not the only ones. I'm hearing people in the media, and even Obama himself, refer to this war almost in the past tense, or, or the near past tense, as though the war is winding down, hostilities are winding down, and this is all part of it. Wait, 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 wait. Is, is the danger of Muslim terrorism, has that been put in check? Doesn't appear like it. We're still in danger every day. So that hasn't been taken care of. Oh, yep. Bin Laden, he was killed. I got it. That was a positive thing. I credit Obama for that. But Bin Laden was not what we were fighting. He was an element of it. He was a significant element of it. But this war has never been about the Taliban or about Al-Qaeda. They're the symptoms, not the disease. We need to reset what this war is all about because evidently everybody's forgotten. This war is against a culture and yes, this war is against a religion. We are fighting Islam and we should not be afraid to say it. We should not be afraid to acknowledge it and we must fight it from that perspective. And when you look at it that way, you will see that Islam is not put in check around the world. Therefore, this war is not over. And I don't care how many troops you bring back. I don't care if you leave Afghanistan, you leave Iraq, you leave here, you leave there. We're going to be back. That's the sad reality of it. You can say we don't have a war all you want to. The conflict is still there. We will be back. We will have to defend ourselves. None of that has changed. None of that will change in the foreseeable future. So this war is not in the past tense. And yet, you have released five terrorists to continue fighting this war against us. This war is not an academic exercise. This war is not a term paper in a comparative political systems class. This war is not an essay question, Mr. President, in your constitutional law class. This war is not about semantics, which so many people have tried to make it about, trying to distinguish between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and militant Muslims and modern Muslims. No! They're all trying to kill us! Don't you get that? This war is not an academic exercise. It is life and death. We are not at war with the Taliban. We are not at war with Al-Qaeda. We are at war with Middle Eastern culture. And as their religion is significantly intertwined into their culture, that means, yes, we are at war with Islam. 
This is a holy war. And it's high time we started treating it like one. No more semantics. No more nuances. No more, oh, we got to try these terrorists, even though the Muslims are not adhering to the Geneva Convention, so there are no rules in this war. Why we feel like we need to obey some bogus set of rules that our enemies are not adhering to, I have no idea. We must stop making distinguishments between our enemies because they feed off of that strength. Because believe me, they are not distinguishing when it comes to us. When they flew those planes into those buildings, they weren't aiming for just certain types of Americans. They were aiming for whatever Americans they could get. When they placed that bomb alongside the road of the Boston Marathon, they didn't care who they killed! Now, the only way to beat an enemy like that is you've got to sink below their level. You've got to meet them eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, bone for a bone, bomb for a bomb. Because if you don't, you won't survive. That's what we're talking about. The only thing that these people understand is violence. They don't understand reasoning. They don't understand negotiation. They understand violence and nothing else. That's how we must treat them. And I will say something now that I have said for years, although I don't think it's ever come up on this show. If we are to win this war, we must perpetrate a house cleaning on the Middle East. It's not possible any other way. What that means, and I can't believe in 13 years this has never really been routinely discussed. It's shocking to me it's never happened. I thought, as I, as I stood on that afternoon of September 11th at my, at my work, my workplace at the time, I thought we would be talking about what I'm about to say within 24 hours. We never have. For us to win this war, the option of nuclear weapons must be on the table. We must not only put that idea on the table, we must use them. We must use nuclear weapons in the Middle East to regain the upper hand in this war and in this world whole thing could turn around real quick if we nuked a few places over there. That's what we should have done on September 12, 2001. And yes, I blame George W. Bush for that. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of blame to go around here. So we must embrace the idea of nuclear weaponry in order to win this war. Forget releasing prisoners. Forget pretending like this war is over when it's anything but. We must nuke them. That is where we need to go next. In closing, you got to remember this, and I know some of what I'm saying now is going to be unpopular, especially some of our younger folks who've never, never really experienced a time of, of, of peace the way that people of my generation did ever so briefly. But peace... In human society, in human condition, peace is fleeting. Peace is not a long-term thing. You cannot look upon peace as an end goal for your uh, foreign relations or your foreign policy or for war or anything like that. When peace comes, it's nice. It's a great thing, but it's never permanent. We had a time period of 10 to 15 years in America where we had relative peace. After the end of the Cold War ending on 9-11. We had some degree of peace. And because that lasted 10 or 15 years to a human being, that's a significant part of their life. Because we live to be, what, 60, 70, 80 years old, if we're lucky. And so 15 years is a long period. So we, we fool ourselves into thinking peace is something that can be lasting. Peace is something that can be permanent. But a basic survey course in world history would tell you otherwise. That, yeah, maybe a civil civilization will go through five or ten years of peace here or there, but it's the exception and not the rule. A constant state of war and preparation for war is what is most normal in the history of humanity. Not only here in America, but everywhere else. That's how human beings roll. And I fear, and I don't know how this has happened during a war, 
But I fear that people alive today, many of them, especially the younger ones, are afraid of war. And, 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 and they're striving for peace at all costs. And Obama is striving for peace even if it kills us. My God, you're chasing something fleeting that you can never have in permanence. We as a nation must guard against war weariness. And I know we are weary of war right now. I, I am too. I'm not saying this because I like war, because I want war. I'm saying it because I understand war is always there. Because I understand conflict is the natural state of human interaction. We must guard against war weariness. Think about France in the time between World War I and World War II. There was a very prevalent idea that went through the philosophical classes, the intellectual classes, the educational establishment there after World War I that we must have peace at all costs. And so when Germany started uh, started reneging on their agreements after World War I that they you know, wouldn't build back up militarily, that they wouldn't fortify the Rhine, they wouldn't do this, they wouldn't do that. And France knew about it, England knew about it, but they didn't confront Germany because the thought of the time was anything but war. Yes, Germany's violating the agreements. Yes, Germany's fortifying the Rhineland. Yes, Germany's building up the military, which they are not allowed to do, but anything but war because the horrors of war were so fresh to them, so fresh in their minds, they did not want to go through it again. And on some level, that's understandable from a human perspective. But, in the long run, what happened? They built themselves up, it allowed Adolf Hitler to come into power, and World War II was on their doorstep. The everlasting peace was short-lived, and in fact, it was, it was destroyed because of the pacifism of the French and to a degree the English. That brought about World War II. Folks, we are looking at the same type of scenario today. We are so war weary that some of us, including our president, are treasonously believing that anything but war is the answer. But we cannot choose not to fight in this war. No more than we can choose to fight in it. The war is here. We didn't ask for it. But either we will win it or we will die. And I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care what part of the political spectrum you come from. Dying at the hands of these Muslims is not an option. It's time to take this seriously. It's time to charge Barack Obama with treason. And it's time to retake the upper hand in this war on terror, which I've always hated that name. It's a war on Islam. That's what it is. Calling this a war on terror is like calling World War II the war on kamikaze pilots. It was so much more than that. Well, this is so much more than the war on terror. Either we win this war or we die. Which choice do you make? It's apparent which choice Barack Obama's made. That's not the choice I'm making. I don't think that's the choice that freedom-loving Americans with the rest of the world and Western civilization depending on us, it's damn sure not the choice we're going to make. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.